my sailor lad, and you and I'll agree. And I'll show you the prettiest oh, that ever you. Larry! You see, Larry, that mute Puritan touch, and it grows more marked as we go along. Rocky! Oh, he slipped his arm around her waist and gazed in her bright blue eyes. Piano! What do you think this dump is? A dump? <laughs> Give him the bum rock up there. Knock him in that room. Come on, bum rock. No, please, Rocky. I'll go crazy in that room alone. It's haunted. Harry, please let me sit here. I'll be quiet. This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Tonight, we have two members of one of the greatest casts to be on Broadway in many years. And here with me, my great co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. The Iceman Cometh is Eugene O'Neill's monumental four-and-a-half-hour play, but in the production at the Brooks Atkinson Theater, the hours fly by like minutes, due in large part to our two guests tonight, Tim Piggott-Smith, who plays Larry Slade, one of the 12 drunks in Harry Hope's saloon, and Michael Emerson, who plays Willie Oban, a member of that dipsomania community. Gentlemen, welcome to Theater Talk. Hi. Thanks uh, there has been much talk, uh, as Susan introduced you, as um, being part of a great... Broadway ensemble. Is that really true? I mean, this is a word that actors tend to throw around a lot. Uh, is it really the case, though, in, uh, in this play? It's particularly true in, in this case, I think, because this is a uh, play with a large cast, and there are no bad parts in it. And there's, it's, uh, although Kevin Spacey plays the sort of focused lead role, it, it depends in a large part on everyone else doing their bit. And, uh, it's uh, it's it's it has that kind of great ensemble energy that you dream of that good old style Broadway ensemble energy. And it's uh, it's fair to say, I guess, that it was Kevin Spacey, your star, who has sort of set the tone for this whole production, for the ensemble nature of the production. Well, Kevin and the and the director Howard Davis yes. was yeah. hugely instrumental. It's just been one of those roller coaster things that we were sold out in London before we even started rehearsing, and it's just kind of gone on. And I think Michael's point about the, <clears throat> the width of the ensemble, there are 19 people in the cast. And we've now had three casts, including two in London, and I haven't seen one bad performance in any of them. Really? Which is extraordinary. Now, you were with the original production at the yeah. uh, Almeida Theatre. Yeah. Uh, did you have any idea when you were uh, tackling this play that uh, The Iceman Cometh, four and a half hours, would wind up in a commercial house in Broadway in New York? Absolutely unthinkable. The first read-through, when we were struggling with our American accents and doing it, was just so <laughs> grisly and so embarrassing. We sat there thinking, what must Kevin Spacey think he's got himself into? This terrible... Kevin went to the uh, director after and said, God, they're all so wonderful, you know. And uh, it was just... It just had a, it had a magic touch from the, the moment we started. Nobody thought it would transfer in London. They thought we might make our money back in six weeks and we made it back in three. Hmm. I mean, it's just... it's just extraordinary. Uh, Michael, you were brought into the, the Broadway production. Uh, you are, of course, known from off-Broadway fans as Oscar Wilde, a terrific yeah. performance in The Three Trials of Oscar Wilde. What was auditioning for this big, big production like? I understand that Kevin Spacey auditioned with everybody many times. Is that, is that true? I, I finally worked my way up to reading with Kevin. Which which was great. I mean, it was it was hard work, but you know, no pain, no gain. I, I this was a play I wanted to be in, and when I heard that it was in London and it was coming to New York, I called my agents and said, "Please see if I cannot be seen for this, because you know this is." I knew it felt like an event coming on the horizon, and I wanted to try to get in. So I auditioned two or three times for the director, and I thought he might like me, but I wasn't sure, and I didn't hear and didn't hear, and then I was called in to read with Kevin, and Kevin could not have been warmer and more gracious. It was actually easier to read for him then because he played all the other parts, and mm. he played them well. So it, it turned out to be a lot of fun across the table, and somehow I guess he decided that I was right, and Howard thought I was right. And now, it's true, isn't it, that, he, that Kevin Spacey had a wall removed backstage in the dressing room so that to, yeah. to keep that community feel there all the well, time, you guys are all together the, in the same The Almeida, room. which is where we open, you have no options. You go down yeah. into this kind of cellar, <laughs> and you're all <laughs> stuck in there. But it works very well for the play. And uh, Kevin, when we went to the Old Vic, they said to him, you know, he could have Olivier's old dressing room at the Old Vic. And he said, no, we're going upstairs. We're going to be in one. So. Uh, when we got here, yeah, he knocked down a, a wall, and he's sitting in the same place uh, in which he sat when he did his uh, Broadway debut, oh. which was, I think, Ghosts with Liv Ullman, 20 years ago. 
and uh, he's in the same corner. And you guys never get tired of each other. I mean, you're on stage together for four and a half hours. You're in the dressing room before well, and after. It's. Uh... I'm on stage all the time, so You're on my, stage dressing, all the my time. dressing room life is limited. <laughs> but no, we get on very well. But it's very joking. Speaking of getting tired, there's been some. It's, you're on stage for four and a half hours, and a, a lot of the time you're supposed to be passed out. Well, I'm not. You're not. I never, you, I never go to sleep. The you, others do. You're yes, like the Greek chorus of the show, yes, so we're yes. commenting on the action. But you have to spend some time asleep. There are characters that spend, yeah, a, a large fraction of the play conked out, and. Uh, in, in some cases, it's a trick for them on a two-show day in particular to Nine hours. stay awake. In but reality. <laughs> as I said earlier, O'Neill is a genius, and he, he even takes care of stagecraft in the text of the play so that he has, uh, he has a built-in alarm clock of, you know, the character of he Willard goes around and bangs <laughs> on the tables uh, just before everyone is supposed to come to and say their speech. So <laughs> it works out nicely, actually. Let me ask you about the play. Um, since you you know you do it every night and you know it better than, probably than the scholars of O'Neill at this point, as great as the play is, it is often criticized for its um, uh, repetition. Mm. Do you think that that's a fair criticism, or living with this play and knowing it so well, uh, do you think it could not have been any other way than the way he wrote it? We've taken, I suppose, <clears throat> maybe <clears throat> three or four pages out of two hundred and fifty odd, so we've trimmed. And I don't think you could take another word out. Really? No, it seems to me that the nature of the, of the play is to do with the repetition of lies and pipe dreams and all that stuff. And uh, the audience have to go through it. They have to experience the pipe dream in order to experience the collapse of mm -hmm. the pipe dream. So you, you find yourself in that thing. I, I think his stagecraft is absolutely phenomenal. You know, because you've got such a rich ensemble, the audience never have a moment to get bored because everybody has a go, you know, with, with the bat, there, the, everybody has a chance. You have a couple of minutes of this and then a couple of minutes of that and then somebody else comes on and then it, it's just astonishing, the variety that he's written into it. When he was writing it, he, he, he spent a long time just creating the bar, mm. the world of the bar. He didn't introduce Hickey into his drafts until very late on. He created that pipe dream world of these people who live together as these happy drunks and then threw in the catalyst very late on. Yeah. I think it's... I think it's I used to think that Long Day's Journey was really his great work of genius, and I'm just coming round now to thinking that just the breadth and scope, the things that he deals with in this play, I think probably this, for me, is just going past. <laughs> and you're, you're... Just as with Shakespeare, I think repetition is a device, and Shakespeare knows that you need to repeat a thing several times if it's of great importance, but you repeat it with a difference. And there's, on some level, repetition becomes mantric or mm -hmm. something in the play. It, and, and you have to live with, if you're going to have a deep experience, you better live with it for a while. I think the length of the play is a bonus in this case, because the audience has to settle in and live with these characters for, for a long time and get real comfortable with them mm. so that it hurts when things happen late in the play. Yeah, that's very true because you, you, you do feel as an audience member, having sat with them for two hours, two and a half hours, before they even go out in the world for the first time, I mean, the conceit of the play being that these people dream that tomorrow they can pull themselves together and get on with their lives, and of course they never will. But when they do go out for the first time as an audience member, you, you, you know horrible things are lurking <laughs> out there for them and they're not going to make it. And mm. one of the things I want to ask you about Kevin Spacey's performance that I think he brings to it that we may not have seen in this play before is there is a sense of villainy about his hickey. I mean, this is a man who in some ways is a sadist in this play. Si <laughs> silence from the, uh, from the masochists. <laughs> Well, I don't know if, I, I think I know where you're drifting, but I don't know if <laughs> villainy is the right word. There is, there is a sense of another agenda. There is a sense of him not being, of us not knowing really what he's about all the time. But that gives the role a sort of a delicious danger. And menace, it, I guess, is a better it, word than menace. villainy. Menace, indeed, you're right. Yeah. And it, it's true that he brings a sort of evil gift with him. I don't know the, the extent to which it's a... A, a malicious gift. But I think most of the other guys in the bar don't feel it. My character picks up on it very quickly. Ah, right, this guy's changed. Right. You know, this is Stubby K, the funny guy who comes in <laughs> suddenly, you know, normally rolls in absolutely plastered. Right. And he comes in looking clean and he's walked from Astoria, you know, and, and says he's got this mission, you know. And Larry just goes, excuse me, <laughs> you know, what's going on here? Yeah, well, uh, your character's interesting too because you, 
I mean, I think it, I, I get the sense in watching you perform it that you begin to fear for what is going to happen to everybody oh, else in that bar with Hickey there and what he's going to do to that. Well, he knows. He's a, he, he is what they call the old philosopher. He can see that if you take people's pipe dreams away from them, as Hickey says on his last thing, he's got nothing, they've got nothing left to live for. Yeah. You know, he comes in and he says, can't you see, you've licked life, you've killed tomorrow. You know, <laughs> what, you've killed tomorrow? Don't be a fool. <laughs> now, uh, one thing we should say about this production is that, and you forget this when you read the play, it's very funny. I mean, much of this four and a half hours plays like a comedy. Terrifically funny play. Uh, for a couple of hours, it's a regular laugh riot, you know. And, but it, and it needs to be, because just like Shakespeare again, O'Neill knows that you can only swallow so much tragedy yeah. without sweetening it up a little bit. And, so it, and it's a great language play, too. It's, mm -hmm. Even in the middle of Hickey's long speech, you know, there's the line when Harry Hope turns to him and says, oh, get on with it, you long with it bastard. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's you know, right, that's right, because it's O'Neill. Yeah, yeah, it's it, O'Neill knowing his audience maybe yeah, doing that way, too, absolutely. and he gives a guy the line. completely like re-energizes the next five minutes. Yeah, absolutely. It's brilliant. So. The, the director has, has the director you all against being the archetypal floppy drunks. Yeah. There's, you know, there's, there's none of that expected drunken behavior. You're all, you all kind of play against type, which is very effective. Well, drunkenness is very slow. Imagine yeah. how long it would take if we all saw it like this. For <laughs> <laughs> seven and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know. I mean, he must have been uh, deliberately, though, trying to keep you from doing the stereotypical absolutely. drunken routines, the Foster Brooks stuff. You know? yeah, well, the, the, the needs of the play, the demands of the play, its language and its momentum, you know, we, we couldn't indulge ourselves in, in a lot of stereotypic drunk behavior. Plus, I think that the truth is that people that are habitually, daily, and brilliantly drunk don't necessarily look the way we might think. Right, right. A lot of people are drunk, and we don't know it. Yeah, like all of us here tonight on the <laughs> <Theater> Talk. <laughs> uh, listen, uh, you guys give great performances in The Iceman Come Up. Really one of the great, great shows I've ever seen in 10 years I've been covering Broadway. It's at the Brooks Atkinson Theater with Tim Piggott Smith and Michael Emerson. And if you can get a ticket, you're very lucky. Luck. You, you extend it for three weeks, but everything, all the $100 seats are gone, I'm told. They played at 99% capacity this week. Yeah, I know. And Manny Azenberg, the producer, told me that they have uh, some obstructed view seats and some of the $20 seats for the students, but mm -hmm. you have to have a valid student ID to get yeah. in. So, uh, Gentlemen, thank you for being our guest tonight. On thank you for Talk. having us. A great pleasure. Mm -hmm. God, if I'm not beginning to think you've gone mad, you're a liar! Well, now, that's a hell of a way to talk to a pal that's trying to help you. If you really wanted to die, you'd just take a hop off your fire escape, wouldn't you? And if you were really in the grandstand, you wouldn't be pitying everyone. Are you the turtle? <laughs> they had a contest on the road. Croup was bad. They timed all the slow guys. How we ate, how long it took us to pack up, shave. I had no idea this was going on. Some of the guys knew. We're trying to go slow. I still beat everybody. Hey, hey, hey. Don't touch the horn. <laughs> Never touch the horn. <laughs> the wonderful play Sideman has just received two Tony nominations. So we thought we'd take the opportunity to show you a segment we did on that play last summer, right before it moved to the roundabout on Broadway. Yes, we interviewed Warren Light, who wrote the play, and the director, Michael Mayer. Uh, Warren was nominated for the play, but Michael Mayer, I think this was an oversight of the Tony Committee. Uh, they did not nominate in Michael's direction, which was superb. I agree. But we brought Michael and Warren together, and they gave us some insights into this fine, fine play, and we'd like to show you an excerpt from that interview right now. So, Warren, for people who haven't seen it, if you could just explain the play, uh, give us the plot of the play, and also so it seems to me to be a very autobiographical play. Perhaps tell us how you came to write the play. Well, uh, I'll answer that. I avoided writing it for 20 years. So it's, it's that autobiographical that I just didn't want to go near it for a while. Uh, and it's the story of four jazz musicians from the 1950s. And uh, we follow them as the jazz world takes a number of hits, beginning with, I guess, Elvis Presley uh, and ending ending for many of them on a club date in 1967 in the basement of a New York place for Lester Lannan, the, the <laughs> ultimate indignity for a jazz man. <laughs> uh, so you follow these four, three trumpet players and a trombonist, and then also the family of one of those trumpet players. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I always tell people, it's, a dis it's another dysfunctional family play, but it, luckily my personal family was in that world, so it's a more interesting context than if they'd been dry cleaners or something. Oh, just explain what a sideman is. Okay, uh, 
you know who the leaders are of a band. Mm -hmm. You might know Stan Kenton and his orchestra, Buddy Rich and his orchestra. It's the guys in the and his orchestra part. Uh, without uh, uh, psychoanalyzing you too much, you did say it took 20 years to write this play. Uh, how autobiographical is it? Was your father a, uh, he's a, a trumpet jazz player? Trumpet he's, a, yeah. he's a very good trumpet player, so I, I, I don't research. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's all right there. People go, oh, you really captured the era. You spent hours in a library. And I think, well, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, it's, um, I, I also grew up in a neighborhood filled with uh, jazz musicians and, and out of work Broadway show people. And so when I wasn't borrowing from my family story, I, there was the baritone player on the 12th floor or mm -hmm. the, the lead trumpet player on the 6th floor. There were enough enough of these guys around. I just didn't know anyone who had a steady job. Until How come it took you 20 years to well, think about this? Well, I think I thought about it and kept not writing it. I, in my 20s, I was mostly a comedy writer. Uh, and you'll find a lot of comedy writers are avoiding other, other <laughs> right. stories. And, um, and that worked pretty well for me. And, and it took me a while to, uh, I think, get enough perspective on it that I could write the piece without either trying to cover things up or without being angry. Mm -hmm. A lot of times uh, a family play, if you write it at 24, I call it the, the screw you mom, screw you dad play. <laughs> right. uh, and, uh, Some of the best writing in the American theater. Yeah, though. no, it's excellent work. <laughs> I just, uh, I guess I wasn't ready. To, it took me a while to find my anger, and then I thought, well, let me just sit with this for a while. It seems like it would have been very painful to write that play, because you also deal with the family alcohol problem in a most vivid manner. Well, there's, there's some stuff. I mean, uh, yeah. all families have their stuff, but yeah. I, I think I, yeah, there's some stuff. And I, I just, I don't know, it took me a while to just uh, come to terms with my own role in that family. And then uh, you go from sort of deifying your parents to demonizing them to yeah. maybe making peace with them. Finally, a little happy meeting. Michael, yeah. I want to bring you in just one last question for you there, Warren. Uh, is your father still alive? Your, sure. your mother still alive? Have they seen the play? Uh, my father has, in his own <laughs> strange way. <laughs> That's the gotcha question there, Warren. <laughs> Michael warned me he'd ask something that would get. Uh, yeah, my father. I asked them both not to, uh, and uh, my father went. And he, I think they both. Uh, my mother says, "Well, if you don't use your family for material, what good are they?" So mm. she's she's pretty. She gets it. She gets it. <laughs> so she's seen it. Or she no, she has, and I've talked it. her through it. Uh, she's pretty understanding of the whole thing, and she sort of and she says, "Oh, your father can go. Nothing embarrasses him." And she's mm. she's fine about that. And tell him the story. Oh well, he came <laughs> to see the show, and I, I said, "I it could be upsetting to you. There's a lot of things in it that you you may not want to see dramatized." Or, and he can, and he's, in fact, the next morning he called me. He'd been up all night long after having seen the play, and I said, "Well, I thought it would be tough." He said, yeah, I was up all night trying to figure out who played the trumpet solo on I Remember Clifford. <laughs> <laughs> it sort of really hit him hard yeah. there. Well, yeah. <laughs> I think the other aspects of it caught up to him. But, it, but it, the story is about a musician who's more focused on his music than his family life. And, and I can't go. tell you how many musicians have asked me the same question since, because it's an obscure <laughs> solo. And the rest of the play is, is this, just like their lives. It's everything between the notes is sort of mm. half-life. Um, Michael, how did you get involved in the play? If you could just give us a sense of what you thought of, thought of it when you first read it. I really tried avoiding reading it almost as long as Warren <laughs> avoided writing it, I think. <laughs> Why? Um, well, I was really busy. I was yeah. doing the, uh, this play at the Vineyard, Antigone in New York, mm -hmm. and I was workshopping Triumph of Love. And this the was musical you directed ago, the musical, year. right. And so I really had very little time in my schedule. And Beth Emelson, who was the producer of an evening for Naked Angels, in which Sideman was going to be part of, said, you've got to read this play. Um, the, the playwright, Warren Light, who I had met once, um, ha really wants you to do it. Please read it. Please read it. I said, Beth, I can't. I can't read it. I don't have time. Please, just, just read, read half of it. Just read it for an hour, and just let me know what you think. Finally, she pestered me enough that I thought, OK, I'll read it. And I was immediately transfixed by it and captivated by the characters and the story, which I related to in my own way, you know, based on my own family dynamic and my mm -hmm. own personal history. And just, it just blew me away. The language, the characters, the structure, everything about it spoke to me vividly and immediately. And I thought, well, I've got to do it. But there's no way that I have the time to do the kind of workshop production that they were talking about. So I met with Warren, and I said, you know, I really love this play, and I would love to do it, but I, it really needs someone who can give um, a full amount of time to it. So would you consider maybe doing less of a production and more of a reading? I said, Michael, that 
which was right. Um, I, I said Michael at half speed is better than most of the directors right. I've worked with at full speed. <laughs> and, uh, so nice. I felt that was, uh, was that the voice of my experience. You know, <laughs> I felt very comfortable, and we casted more or less out of our rolodexes. Right. Uh, we, so, so you didn't do a workshop. You just went right into oh, CS. No, this, no, was, this was two years ago. Oh, we did a workshop at the in the basement, basement of, of the West, West Bank, Bank Cafe. Cafe. They're my mentors, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's a place that I knew of, you know, from Playwrights Horizons yeah. and the Young Playwrights Festival. So to us, it was a very low key situation. Except this play was just so great, and it needed work. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was going to ask you about that, when you get a play that needs work, because uh, it is a fine play now, but goes through a process it's like everything else. It had no plot at the beginning. It had no plot. It's interesting. What is your what What do you What do you say to him? You know, what was what was the element that was missing? Was what were you frank. pushing him to do? Wasn't I? I mean, I, there were yeah. certain events that didn't occur in the play. There was uh, stylistically and tonally, there were um, big shifts that were unexplained. There was at the point when I first read it, everyone talked to the audience at different. It was raw. That, that was probably the autobiographical draft, mm -hmm. uh, and then you go through about thirty drafts and impose things on it, I think. The heart of the play and the meat of the play was all there. I mean, it just needed editing and it needed some restructuring and rethinking and it needed some some courageous rewrites. And I've said this before and I'll say it again, I've never seen such brave work on the part of a playwright to just go in there. I mean, the day before we had our first public reading of it, Warren came in with two really harrowing scenes, one of them being the scene with um, the mother in the institution, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the other being the scene where he kicks his father out. I don't so, know, I left them out. <laughs> <laughs> those, play, those scenes didn't exist. <laughs> Maybe you weren't ready to do that. God or climax, something. Right. <laughs> uh, Warren, if you could just tell us sort of a technical writer question, I guess, but when you have written this sort of raw autobiographical mm -hmm. play, how then do you kind of pull yourself back and allow the, the, the craftsman part of the writer then to come in to give it some shape? Well, it, it helps. We're, we've always been in a pretty good supportive environment. I think this notion of the writer alone in a room handing in the draft and saying, see you at opening, you know, <laughs> that's not, there's no reality to that. I had actors who we trusted almost immediately. Uh, and I don't have a, a tin ear. You can tell as much as you love your writing and you love your characters, and you can tell when it's laying there. And uh, someone says the word like, you need an event in your second act. And that makes sense. And, uh, and I've also, for better or worse, I've done a lot of writing for hire, where I've had to learn to detach mm -hmm. from every draft the moment I hand it in. Uh, and I don't like that when I do it in a screenplay. I don't like that process particularly. Pays well, though, that, uh, that punching it, up it the dialogue, right? Pays a little better than the theater work. <laughs> the roundabout. This is a, well, the roundabout's right. actually. <laughs> way better than uh, <laughs> at, at the West Bank, we got coffee. And um, <laughs> so the, I, I know how to pull back. I still get, can get caught up watching the play. But, but at the end of, uh, of a show, you, if you're watching the audience a little and you're listening to when people cough and, and all this sort of telltale signs of audience misery, uh, and you're listening to your director, you start to get a sense of, oh, something needs to happen in the second act. And then when you figure out what happens in the second act, maybe it's good to go set that up a little in the first act. And it's that thing where you fix a little part here and then the other part feels a little flabby. And you, I mean, you, uh, you go back and forth. Uh, the play is called Sidemen. It is by Warren Light, directed by Michael Mayer. And it is at the Roundabout Theater for uh, an indefinite run in the summer? or I think through the summer. Through summer, September. into September. Yeah. Into September. Don't okay. miss it. Don't Terrific miss it. play. Thank you for being our guest, Warren Thanks. and Michael. It was so much fun to be back. So the play ran past the summer, and it's still running. Yeah, and we hope it has a long life. It's been a little shaky at the box office, but maybe it's Tony Award nomination, and if it wins, that'll help it. And there's a, there are a lot of rumors about a big television star that they're going to uh, bring into the show. Oh, that would be terrific. Any yes. Any names? Uh, um... I can't say at this point. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I've been sworn to secrecy. I've been sworn to secrecy. Well, maybe if we find out, I'll run it as a crawl across the screen. Okay. okay, we'll see you next time on Theater Talk, and let's close now with Sidemen. From the time I was four, I knew the family was headed for financial ruin. Are you going to finish your crackers? <laughs> the time I was six, I and everyone else knew that it would be up to me to save. I heard about people making money with money, but I always figured that was a sick head to get into. Yeah. yeah. Jazzonomics is why I can't afford to take the RISD scholarship. 
Someone has yeah, to. But how does he collect next year if he just works three weeks? Here's the beauty part. I already got my 20 weeks in, so every week I'm on the books now. This kind of talk used to drive my mother crazy. So the kid works three weeks at his TV gig, quits. Then I do club dates under his name. The union won't know. You work 17 weeks under his name. And he gets his 20 weeks That way you collect. And he pays you cash for the gigs you do under his name. You're getting your weeks on. Yes, 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 yes. It's not TV, it's advertising. I don't have the job yet, I may not get it. If I do get the gig, I may not quit. <laughs> well, it might be worth trying to stay. I have no son. <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Friedrich Lowe Foundation, the Harburg Foundation, and public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Playbill Online is the official website of Theater Talk and the home of the Playbill Club providing exciting opportunities for theater lovers. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.